Hello, my name is Greg Hacker. I'm a senior public health biologist with the California Department of Public Health Vector Borne Disease Section. Today's webinar, I'll be reviewing uh, the status of plague in California, and that includes um, past trends uh, with, with the uh, initial introductions of plague into California, as well as um, current objectives of our plague program and, um, and future directions. Uh, so here's just an outline of what I'll be discussing today. Uh, first, I will briefly describe uh, what plague is generally. Uh, then I'll I'll move on to the early plague in California, uh, including those initial introductions and um, subsequent urban outbreaks and, and control efforts. Then uh, I'll discuss a little bit about the spread spread of plague um, from those urban centers throughout the rest of California, which will bring us up to the early 80s, um, where I'll begin the review of of recent plague activities by our our program. Um, then uh, I'll summarize our plague uh, surveillance and control efforts in uh, last year, 2020. And I'll wrap up with um, just a quick summary of, of some of our future directions and, and goals of the program. So briefly, uh, what is plague? Plague is a, is a well-known disease of, of man and, and, and most mammals. Um, caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Uh, it is a gram-negative bacteria um, and, and has this spindle shape to it, which is, is diagnostic or par partially diagnostic if you're looking at a, at a stained slide. And you can see uh, an example of that in that circular figure in the, in the middle there in, in red. Those are the, the, um, the bacteria themselves. Um, and it was uh, first isolated by Alexander Yersin in uh, 1894 uh, in Hong Kong. Um, he was um, sent there by the Pasteur Institute to try and get an idea or a handle on the, uh, the ongoing plague outbreak um, that was happening on the, uh, on the island of Hong Kong. Um, plague is typically, or Yersinia pestis is typically transmitted uh, among rodents and to um, to humans uh, via flea bite. Um, rodents are the, the primary reservoirs, and um, although there are some other um, like rabbits and lagomorphs that can um, also um, be infected, but rodents are the primary uh, reservoirs and hosts of, of the bacteria. Um, and you can see a, a very simplified uh, cycle between the rodents, fleas, and, and their uh, the back Yersinia pestis on the left there. Um, there are three clinical forms of uh, plague in humans, and, and those are bubonic, septicemic, and pneumonic plagues that are plague. And I'll get into that a little bit more right now. So uh, bubonic plague, uh, which is what I'm sure most people think of when they hear of plague, um, is it's actually it's the most common form in in the United States. About 80% of cases um, in, in the past have been the bubonic uh, type, um, and what that is, it's typically transmitted by a flea bite. And um, what basically happens is the bacterium invade the lymphatic system. Um, they migrate to the lymph nodes where their our bodies produce a, a pretty significant immune reaction in response, which um, includes swollen and, and tender lymph nodes, um, which we call buboes in the neck, armpit, or groin. And that's typically near the site of the, uh, the flea bite itself. You can see an example of a bubo on the, the picture on the right there. Um, and pre-antibiotics um, and, and good health care, the mortality rate from bubonic plague is somewhere around 50% uh, or so. Uh, the next form is septicemic plague, uh, which basically just means it's a blood infection. The bacteria have entered the bloodstream and, and disseminated that way. That can be either primary or secondary. So secondary is um, from secondary to bubonic. So you've picked up bubonic plague. Um, it then from the lymphatic system goes into the bloodstream um, and disseminates that way. Uh, primary septicemia, um, which we've had a few cases of, um, recently is where the bacteria seem to just directly go straight into the bloodstream. There's no evidence of buboes or anything like that. 
and uh, you can see it, it can go to the extremities and cause gangrene and, and things like that, which is an example on the right there. And uh, the final form is pneumonic plague, uh, basically where the bacteria enters the lungs and infects the lungs and causes pneumonia and, and a, mu immu a severe immune response there. Um, again, it can be secondary um, to bubonic plague or um, primary from inhalation. And what that means, and that's really the, the worst case scenario, is either human to human transmission, somebody picks up plague and is in their lungs and it's coughing, the other person breathes that in, similar to the, the, the situation we find ourselves in today with COVID. Um, and then the other way of uh, route of primary inhalation is, is via pets that have gone out and picked up plague um, from chasing rodents that are sick. Uh, they come back to you and, um, and you inhale their cough or something like that, um, which we've seen a few cases of that as well. Now this is the um, most severe form of plague uh, with a very high mortality rate, up to 90%. Um, and again, this was pre um, healthcare and, and antibiotics, that kind of thing. Um, we're much better these days at treating all forms of plague um, as long as they're caught early, but it's still a very serious um, disease and um, people die of it every year. So, I mean, we, we all I'm sure have heard um, and, and know of plague or the bubonic plague or uh, as the black death. Um, or the medieval plague, or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, probably learned about it in school or over the news um, occasionally. Um, and just briefly, what that was, uh, for those that don't know, is uh, the same critter, um, Yersinia pestis, um, back in 1324, uh, is, is where it began in China or Asia and, and spread uh, to much of the known world at the time. And that includes uh, the rest of Asia, North Africa, um, the Middle East and, and Europe. And, you know, estimates vary, but anywhere from 25 to 50 million people um, were estimated to, to have died from plague during this outbreak, which was a pretty significant proportion. Um, there was an earlier outbreak of plague um, called Ju the Justinian plague um, in the early first century or first millennia. Um, but um, I'm not going to go into that basically the same circumstances. Um, and again, a lot of people died. So it's a very serious disease of the past and of, of the present. Um, so what we're, we're currently undergoing what we consider the third wave of plague, um, which began in, in, 1860, in the 1860s in China. Um, and since shipping and trade routes were pretty much established throughout the world, it pretty much spread throughout the world um, via those, those shipping uh, routes and trade routes. Um, and that includes the continental United States in 1900 um, and prior to that in 1898 in, in Hawaii, um, which I'll get to in a bit. So moving on, um, plague in California uh, started in, uh, it was it first introduced in California in 1900 um, in uh, in San Francisco um, and, and in LA in 1908. Both of these were at ports um, and uh, on the upper right there you see a picture of, of uh, the wharf in, in San Francisco about that time. Um, so as you can see there's there's plenty of ships coming in um, and most of those probably had a uh, rat species, um, be that black rat or Norway rat of some variety, um, carrying the, the flea on the upper left which is um, uh, Synopsis lechiopis. Um, which is the, uh, the primary vector of, of uh, some of these urban rodent plague outbreaks. Um, so going, uh, stepping into this a little bit, um, like I said, plague uh, was first introduced in the continental United States in 1900 in uh, San Francisco. Um, that could either have been via black rats, Norway rats, um, probably both um, on these trade ships. Um, now in, in San Francisco particularly, there, there seemed to, or there were two uh, waves of plague, if you will, um, an early and, and then a later wave. So the, the early wave was really focal and um, it was centered in Chinatown. 
uh, primarily. And that was from about 1900 to 1904. Um, and it had about 121 cases with 113 deaths. So a pretty high 93% uh, mortality rate, uh, which is which is very high. Um, now towards the end, 1903, 1904, they had started um, doing you know rodent eradication efforts, um, trying to button up some of these older buildings that could have been, and, and they had to you know condemn some other buildings that weren't um, able to be um, retrofitted, things like that. So they were starting to get a handle on the situation, um, and then um, in 19 from the 1905 to 1902. A nine, there was a secondary uh, spread of plague that was a little more widespread, um, not just in Chinatown. And, and that one had 160 cases uh, with 78 deaths, um, which is about a 49% mortality rate. Um, now, the second wave, uh, it, was, it was fairly clear what, what seemed to cause it, and, and that was the, the great earthquake in, in 1906 in, in San Francisco along the San Andreas Fault. Um, and then the subsequent fire that pretty much destroyed the city. Um, you can see here on the left, uh, the fire that was raging, and then on the right, the, the um, aftermath, which is pretty much a, a gutted city at that point. And so while they were making headway on this plague outbreak, this came along and, and really um, created just a lot of garbage and rubble and, and, and situations that commensal rodents rats really like um, so they their population exploded um, spread out and carried plague with them and um, you know one of the obviously the, the earthquake and the fire was was tragic but the silver linings when you're thinking about plague um, is that you know a lot of times back in, in these times they had to condemn and and, and demolish buildings. Um, well, the, the earthquake and fire pretty much did that for them. And so while the immediate you know, effects were uh, the population of rats and plague exploded, um, once they were able to clear that rubble and then start rebuilding, um, they were able to then incorporate some of the knowledge that they've gained over the past few years on how to keep rodents out of buildings um, and how to build things correctly do better sanitation and rodent control um, that they were eventually able to get um, the situation under control by about 1909. Um, and that was really the that's the story of plague in, in, in San Francisco anyway. Um, and we haven't seen much um, some on the outskirts since, but nothing in the actual city of plague ever since then. Um, now the other the other uh, outbreak, major urban outbreak that I wanted to highlight um, was a little bit later um, in, in LA. And so, like I said earlier, plague was first introduced to LA in, in the port of Long Beach in, in 1908, um, where they subsequently, you know, took them a while, but they got it what they thought was under control. Obviously not. Um, as we can see in, in 1924, there was an outbreak of 32 cases um, and 30 deaths. So again, super high mortality. Um, this was in the what's now Olvera Street near the big train station. Um, there was also a train station back then, but not nearly as big. Um, and you can see on the pictures on the right, some of the living conditions um, that were just ripe for, for rat infestation. So, you know, condemned buildings, fallen over buildings, um, just rows and rows of shanties. Um, that you know, rats, rat populations really thrive on. Now, the the primary difference between the the San Francisco area and the LA area was there there was no um, major earthquake to basically get rid of all of all of these um, issues. So uh, the pest control and and local government officials. Um, implemented some fairly drastic control measures and um, as you can see from these three photos um, the the photo on the left is a cleared shanty town basically all the shanties are on a train car now um, in pieces there's just remnants of old buildings in the middle and then um, some buildings and, and parts of neighborhoods they actually just um, burned to the ground 
And so uh, what was unfortunate about some of these is that the control measures were unevenly implemented. Um, they were kind of directed at more poor neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, some of the burning of the buildings probably didn't have to occur. They were they were doing retrofits of, of other buildings nearby um, that, you know, they knew what to do. They knew how to keep rodents out. But uh, for one reason or another, they they felt these these poor neighborhoods um, required this level of of control, which uh, was effective, but um, maybe like I said, a little uneven unevenly applied. But um, again, they were effective, and after 1925, there were no more uh, human cases in this area. And uh, from there. Um, the plague spread um, from those commensal rodents, from those urban centers to the sylvatic rodent, uh, rodents, um, which are our native uh, squirrel populations, um, chipmunks, things like that. Um, and so, like I said, the control in, in those urban areas were effective, but um, the rural spread um, because of the nature of uh, this emerging system um, was pretty much unstoppable, even though as this picture or photo shows, they tried their best. They they killed a lot of, of California ground squirrels, even had children bring them tails uh, for a bounty, that kind of a thing. Um, but it was never, they were never going to be able to, to stop it. Um, I'll let this animation play through a few times, but um, what it basically is, is those orange counties are the initial introductions of plague in California. And what these blue highlighted counties are showing are the spread of plague in wild rodents from 1909 to 1949. And you can say, see early on it, it stuck to the coasts, but um, in the late 20s and 30s and 40s is when you really saw see the spread um, from those coastal areas to inland to the Sierras to the far north and south parts of the state. Um, and so, like I said, it was it was spreading via these sylvatic or, or native rodents, primarily ground squirrels um, initially, and it was just unstoppable and it was fairly, fairly rapid um, until um, it comes to what you see today, which um, are represented by these two uh, two maps here, um, both basically saying the same thing. But these are the the, the areas we can in California we consider endemic for plague uh, currently. Um, the area on the left is just a county level map. Um, doesn't have obviously the detail that um, the map on the right has, which uh, is basically incorporating an elevational limit, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. But um, the point here being that by the, the late 40s or 50s, uh, plague had spread to these areas and it's pretty much um, been there ever since. Now, uh, another, you could call it a silver lining um, from after those uh, initial urban outbreaks is the, the fact that spreading to these, these rural or, or um, sylvatic rodent populations um, less po less populated by humans um, meant that there's basically way many fewer cases of plague um, overall in a given year. Uh, we were seeing like we saw 32 cases in, in LA um, from 1927 to, to now. The most we've ever seen in a year is six uh, human cases and that was in 1984. So uh, many fewer cases um, and you can see there's this cyclical nature um, where we'll see peaks every, you know, decade or couple decades, something like that. Um, but from 1927 to 2020, uh, 2020 is kind of cut off on the end there. Um, but there's uh, there's been 65 total human cases with an average age of about 30 years. Youngest was a year and a half. Oldest was 75 years or 79 years. Um, and the other point I wanted to make with this is the, like I said before, we're getting a lot better at treating. Um, plague and and the outcome is is getting uh getting better so early on you see a lot of those blue bars those are are deaths from plague and recently from the 80s on um we've had many fewer deaths um, as a result of plague infection 
Uh, now, when you when you throw that same data out onto a map, uh, county level map, you can see the the distribution of those those cases of plague um, in California. Um, again, pretty much follows that endemic those couple endemic maps that I showed you. Um, you can see that, or can't really see that here, but again, the the these are cyclical. Um, it's a, it's a cyclical disease, um, and we had our peaks in the 30s, 40s, 80s, and 90s. Um, now, what you can't see, and you, you may have seen in the, the previous time lapse video, um, but human number of human cases and then associated, you know, rodent activity of, of plague generally shifted from a coastal system to inland areas that are greater than 4,000 feet in elevation, which is um, why we use that limit um, to inform some of our endemic maps these days. Along with that shift from coastal to inland um, and from urban to, to rural, really, we, we saw in our program uh, the strategy shifted from control and attempts at eradication to surveillance and prevention. Um, and this was done primarily so that we could better determine the risk um, to humans because it was a new system. We didn't know where it was going to stick around um, and where the real risk to humans were was. Um, and in doing so, we, we needed to better understand the ecology of plague. And so before I get into to the nuts and bolts and some of the numbers, I wanted to just kind of go over a, a generalized uh, plague transmission cycle, at least for California's. Um, so this kind of what led up in all the work in the 30s and 40s and 50s on, on figuring out this emerging system uh, led it led to our current thoughts on, on transmission of plague in California um, and, and led to this basic idea of um, there's essentially two cycles uh, and, and one is called the enzootic transmission cycle uh, to, and that's dealing primarily with what we're calling resistant reservoirs or, or those rodent species that may pick up plague, get infected, but don't necessarily, you know, all die. There's some um, proportion of those or a good proportion of those that survive. Um, and so this, this transmission cycle is typically low lying. It's kind of like a simmer. There's not these mass die offs of, of rodents um, in like recreational areas or, or anything like that. Um, maybe one dies every once in a while, but it's this kind of low lying, um, it's, it's hard to detect um, transmission. And that's where there's um, there's also this little secondary system with uh, carnivores um, that are roaming around eating primarily rodents and um, occasionally picking up plague. And, and that uh, part of that system plays a big role in our current um, surveillance and, and control, or mostly surveillance. Um, so that's in zootic transmission. So, and then the other, the other cycle would be the epizootic transmission cycle. Um, and this is where you start to see these big die-offs. This is where plague really ramps up in the rodent population. Um, and that's typically among susceptible or what we call amplifying reservoirs. Um, and, and in many cases, uh, those are the same rodent species that are involved in the other, the enzootic transmission cycle. Um, there's just something that has changed be that uh, climate or density of rodents or density of fleas on those rodents. Uh, there's numerous um, things that can that can uh, change or, or or tip that threshold into becoming that epizootic transmission. Um, and now the when when these epizootic events happen, that's typically when humans are um, infected or you know pick it up, um, as well as our our pets. And that's not to say that. We haven't picked it up um, during those other kind of low-lying simmering enzootic uh, phase, um, but it's just much more rare. And so that that's that's kind of the the two main uh, cycles we have um, in the Western United States, basically, but definitely in California. And it's not black or white; it's not either or. Um, there's shades of gray in between, and it really depends on the conditions on the ground at that point in time. Um, 
whether something is considered enzootic or epizootic. So it's very complex and difficult to kind of point or uh, pin down. And so th those kind of the, the knowledge of those two systems and the critters that are involved have informed our plague surveillance program. And what it basically entails is two, there's two basic constituents. There's the, the rodent portion and then the carnivore portion. Um, now the the rodent portion um, is is kind of the bulk of our surveillance program. It's it's uh, primarily made up of what we call active surveillance, and that's where uh, vector-borne disease section biologists or local vector control districts or health dis um, health uh, departments uh, go out and trap rodents in areas that they think there is a risk to humans. So campgrounds, day use areas things like that. Um, and that's where we go out, we sample rodents, um, take their their samples back to the lab and, and test for exposure to um, uh, Yersinia pestis. Uh, and that informs our notifications and whether we need to do control and any follow-up uh, surveillance. Now there's also a passive component to our rodent program and that, and that is uh, primarily involves carcass testing so um, we rely on the public and collaborating agencies like the forest service or fish and wildlife or state parks um, to let us know when rodent die-offs occur in public use areas um, and hopefully they'll let us know and we can collect those carcasses those rodent carcasses and um, send them to the lab for testing um, another aspect of of the passive component would be um, visual counts so uh, our, our biologists we go out and um, we make visits to campgrounds um, talk with hosts things like that um, and while we're doing that a lot of times we'll we'll drive through or walk through an area just to get an idea of what the rodent abundance is doing um, and that way over time we can kind of get an idea of well is is there is that a kind of low number of rodents or do they look good or you know things like that um, also go into that that part of the program. Um, so so that's the the rodent portion. Uh, the the carnivore portion um, is uh, is much more passive or opportunistic in nature. We're not actually going out and sampling coyotes or whatever ourselves. We we rely on on collaborating agencies um, to sample for us. And and a lot of the carnivore samples we do get are associated with depredation activities. So you know, problem coyotes or bears or or things like that that are, um, you know, eating chickens or going through garbage and, and can't be re rehabilitated um, will be euthanized in some manner. And then we, as a byproduct, get um, some samples to test for plague, uh, which are, are super important and helpful, which I will get into um, right now. So I'm, I'm going to go over in some detail the uh, the carnivore program here. Um, it was established in 1974 um, with the CDC, uh, USDA, and, and several state health departments, but our, um, for California, it's obviously the California Department of Public Health. Um, and this was in response to a few studies that showed that carnivores uh, could be experimentally and naturally infected uh, with Yersinia pestis, um, and that they were also associated with some human cases of plague. Um, and also there was um, a new test and or sampling uh, strip made available. Basically, it's a filter paper strip called an abudo um, that makes it super easy. You just soak, soak it or put it in a blood sample. It soaks it up, you dry it. You don't have to, there's no special storage or anything like that. Made it super easy for um, folks out in the field to, to collect samples for us. Um, now, again, this is mostly opportunistic sampling of carnivores. Um, but we tried to emphasize um, or try to get as many samples from areas um, where it is difficult for our biologists to get to. So areas with limited rodent sampling that are far, basically. Modoc County, Siskiyou County, um, anywhere where it's, we just basically don't have the rodent samples. Um, and there's always this kind of overarching question of, you know, whether whether carnivores are actual good indicators of plague activity in a, in a region. Um, and I'll go into that in a little bit. 
Um, but basically what we're trying to use or what this was set up for was to use carnivores as a sentinel for to to give us some sort of indication of whether plague is is currently active in the rona population in a given area. And so here's just a, a, a real simple graph over time of number of uh, carnivores sampled and then um, the overall seroprevalence. And the seroprevalence is a bit misleading because generally we don't get enough samples to get a good statewide estimate. And a lot of time those samples are biased by, you know, whatever collector is, is giving us the most samples if it's next to a rodent hotspot or a plague hotspot, that kind of thing. So the seroprevalence, it, it fluctuates pretty wildly. Um, but what's key here is the is the total number of samples that is also fluctuated. Um, we've gone as high as eight nine hundred samples in a year. More recently, though, there's been a kind of a downward trend, um, and we've only had somewhere around hundred samples um, each of the last couple of years, which isn't really enough to give us uh, kind of an estimate of prevalence anywhere really. Um, so what we're we're really keen in on here in the carnivore program is just if we get a positive um, carnivore, we then use that to inform our rodent surveillance um, nearby to say, hey, maybe we should look somewhere nearby. Something might be going on. And that's really how we've been using it. Um, here's just a, a breakdown of, of uh, some some of the critters that we've been we've had sampled as well as uh, distribution of um, number of positives, which are in the black dots on the map on the right. And then basically the darker green indicates um, higher seroprevalence in that carnivore population. Again, there's a lot of little biases that go in here into whether who's sampling and when and their, their biases and things like that. But um, generally you see positive carnivores in those endemic areas that I showed you earlier um, along the Sierra Crest. Um, in the in the Modoc Plateau, in the transverse range in the Southern California, um, and even in some co some coastal areas. Um, and on the left here is just a table of some of the, like I said, some of the critters that we sample. Um, but which I wanted you to key in on here is um, Canis latrans, which are coyotes, um, which are the vast majority of samples that we we've tested um, over the years, and they have a average seroprevalence of almost nine percent which is decent. Um, you can see others like Lynx Rufus, Bobcats, um, 23.5%, um, gray foxes, badgers, black bears are good. Um, they have a high seroprevalence. So all of this is indicating that these critters have been exposed to um, the bacteria at some point in the recent past. Um, now, obviously they didn't die from it because we were able to sample them. So. They picked it up in the near past in some area in part of their home range. So like I said, we're using these these positives to indicate where we might um, want to do some rodent surveillance. Moving on to a review of rodent data from our program from uh, 1984 to 2020. Um, on the left side y axis, you'll see that there's rodent seroprevalence. And on the which corresponds with the uh, the dotted black line, and the right side y-axis is the total number of samples, which corresponds with the blue bars. Uh, but I think what um, will stand out to most people are the orange reddish arrows uh, with numbers on them, which correspond to years where we've had human cases of plague, and then the number indicates the number of human cases in that given year. Um, but I think. Uh, kind of the general trend here or the gist that I'm, I'm hoping people can pull away from this is uh, one that again uh, plague activity in rodents is very cyclical you can see these uh, these overall peaks in um, the 80s the 90s uh, even in the aughts although it was a fairly small peak and then again um, in 2015 2016 when we had um, cases in, in Yosemite so you can see that there there are these cyclical peaks in rodent abund or, uh, rodent plague activity, um, and then also you can see that our level of effort varies from year to year, decade to decade. Um, I'd say generally we're overall trending downward with the number total number of samples that we um, or rodents that we sample each year, 
uh, that corresponds with, I mean, lots of different issues logistically and, and um, other things. But uh, more recently, um, what you can't see here is the shift in the, the species that we're actually sampling. So early on in the, in the 80s and 90s, we were uh, sampling primarily California ground squirrels. And in the last decade or so, we've, we've shifted, um, still collecting a fair amount of California ground squirrels, but we've shifted to um, other species, mainly chipmunks, uh, which we think are um, probably more important, at least in some Sierra locations, uh, for that enzootic maintenance. So we're trying to kind of pick up on some of the that simmering um, enzootic transmission, in addition to any epizootics that may be may be happening. And that's that's a good thing to point out is um, you'll probably see either during years where we've had human cases or the year after, you can see that there's typically a, a fairly substantial increase in the total number of samples we've uh, we we test in that next year or that given year. And that's that's going to be um, primarily because we're looking for plague in an area where a, hu a human case was. So um, that that all flows logically. Um, and so here's that same data plotted out on a, on a map and in, uh, in the table form. So on the map, uh, you can see it's it's pretty much it's the 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 same trend that we've shown you a couple different times pretty much follows those endemic maps. Um, this is primarily this data is what is driving those endemic maps anyway. Um, but you see those black dots represent positive rodents from 1984 to 2019. Uh, you can see along the Sierra axis, MODOC, um, the transverse range, and some of the peninsula peninsular ranges down in San Diego and Riverside counties. Um, and the darker orange indicates greater seroprevalence. So Plumas County has some of the highest seroprevalence in the northern part of the state. Um, again, this all varies depending on how you want to break things up, but we broke it into 5% uh, increments. On the right there, there's a lot of data. You're not meant to absorb most of it, but um, what I did want to point out is, are, are two things. Basically, there are two groups of rodents that we um, we sample, and those are cyrids, which are squirrels, and then there's the chrysidids, which are wood rats and deer mice and, and um, things like that. Um, and you can see, for the most part, um, you know, early on in the 30s, 40s, 50s, up into the 80s, people thought that that deer mice and voles were pretty important in the ecology of plague in California. Recently, with more data, we've kind of gone away from that, other than in very localized areas, like the there's a one region, um, San Bruno Mountain in near San Francisco that had a little deer mouse vole cycle. Um, but for the most part, squirrels it's is where it's at um, no matter where you are in the state and uh, for the most part it's it's these three that are highlighted in orange that are um, kind of important as as far as sentinel species so otis permophilus bgi which is california ground squirrel we sampled more of those than any other rodent species and they have about five and a half percent seroprevalence uh, tamius spa is um, chipmunks there's a, a fair number of chipmunk species throughout the state and like i've Discuss. They all have um, varying susceptibilities. So, but overall, they have a nine percent seroprevalence, prevalence. So they're fairly important. And then uh, Tamia cyrus douglasii, which is a pine squirrel or a chicory or a dug squirrel, whatever you want to call it. Um, haven't sampled nearly as many of those, but of the 350 or so we have sampled, almost 19 percent have been exposed at one point to plague. So um, they're interacting with Critter, uh, critters that are um, that are picking up plague. So um, something important going on there, and we'll discuss that in a bit. Uh, so here are just uh, some images or some of the main players. I'm going to break these down and, and give you the the rundown on each one of these uh, species. But I thought it would be good to introduce them first visually. Uh, so. This first group um, on the left hand side there you have obviously your chipmunks. Um, 
now, like I said, there's multiple species of chipmunks in the Sierras, and depending on where you are, there can be multiples in a multiple species in a in a single location. Um, and primarily, they, they have a variable susceptibility um, uh, between these species, to, susceptibility to plague between these species, and even within a species. So the same species of chipmunk um, in the northern Sierra may have a different susceptibility than that same species in the southern Sierra. Um, it really comes down to local conditions and densities and, and things like that. Um, they have been associated with human cases of plague. Um, and the, the common fleas found on chipmunks are good vectors of plague. And uh, for the most part, like I said, there's there's many species, but the, the primary species we um, think are important in plague ecology in, in California are Tamia senex, which is uh, Allen's or shadow chipmunk, uh, Tamius quadrimaculatus, which is a long-eared chipmunk, um, and Senex is is more of a northern species, and quadrimaculatus is pretty much the the central to northern Sierra, um, and Tamius aminus, which is the yellow pine chipmunk, is probably the most widely distributed of the chipmunks and likely the most important um, for plague anyway. And then there's Tamius miriamii, which is uh, more southern. Um, ranging and it's been found with plague in certain spots. There was a spot in Ventura County um, that uh, had significant numbers of, of positive Miriam, Miriam's chipmunks, um, but we don't have much data on them in other areas, so the jury's still out on that. Uh, moving on to the middle column there, you have the California ground squirrel and um, these were the, the critters that were responsible for, likely responsible for that uh, quick spread of plague throughout California. Um, and again, these have a variable susceptibility among individuals and, and populations. So again, depending on the local conditions, um, there may be, if it was a, just a pure uh, colony of ground squirrels, they may be highly susceptible or highly resistant or somewhere in between. It really just depends. Um, they are associated with many human cases of plague, um, and that's likely, or it's been hypothesized to to be attributed to its its primary uh, flea, which is Aropsa montana. Um, and the story with that is the um, this species of flea has a really long proboscis, and um, hypothetically, that's to allow it to more easily pierce the thicker skin of a California ground squirrel or ground squirrels in general. Um, now, this also translates to being able to pierce the skin of humans, which is thicker than a deer mouse or a chipmunk, something like that. So it is supposed to or hypothetically can um, allow the, the, um, the transmission of the plague bacteria more easily. Um, additionally, California ground squirrels can have uh, notoriously high flea loads um, of these Aropsal montana. Um, we've captured some with over 100 fleas off of an animal, probably even more. So, you know, if one of those were to die, get sick and die of plague and, uh, you know, had 100 fleas, those 100 fleas are going to try to find a warm body fairly quickly. So um, that's uh, additionally the the, the amount of fleas on an animal or um, the density of fleas can affect how fast uh, or whether um, spread of plague is going to occur. Now the critter on the right, uh, this dug squirrel, is a bit different from these other two um, in that they're a pretty highly resistant species, or that's what we think anyway. Um, and because of this, we think they are an important and zootic or a maintenance species. Um, and there's um, some anecdotal evidence more recently uh, out of when we had a couple cases of plague in Yosemite. Um, one of the locations where we, we pinpointed that one of the cases may have picked up plague um, was usually just full with California ground squirrels. Uh, when we went in to do our surveillance, we caught a handful, um, not very many at all. But what remained were Douglas squirrels running around, um, high density of Douglas squirrels. Um, I don't know if we remember if we actually caught any um, or tested any that were positive because they're really hard to catch. Um, 
but we have, like I said, had high uh, seroprevalence in, of the, in the past, and their their common fleas um, are often good vectors of plague, and they're they're often shared with the local rodent population, particularly chipmunks. So there is the potential for these fleas to be um, passing between one another um, in, between species. Um, now th they are these are restricted more in, in Northern California. So Southern California is a, a bit different. Okay, uh, so this last group is kind of a spectrum here. So the the critter on the left, the golden mantle ground squirrel, um, it's different from all the rest in this in of the all the other rodents that I'm going to talk about here, um, in that it's highly susceptible to plague. Uh, meaning that if you know a hundred of these animals were to be inoculated with plague, a hundred of them would probably die. Um, very, very rarely do we see serologically positive California ground squirrels, meaning they don't survive to produce an antibody response um, that we can pick up. So we we therefore call these these guys a uh, amplifying host. Um, and they're strictly involved in that epizootic phase of uh, cycle of, of plague in California. Um, it's a higher elevation fe uh, species and it's common flea, which is um, in the same genus as, as the California ground squirrel flea, um, Aropsala Idaho idahoensis is also a good vector of plague. And so for those same reasons uh, for the Aropsala montana, um, it can also you know, be important for transmission to humans. Um, wood rats, they're the critter in the middle column there. Um, they're they're kind of all over the place. So um, they again, they have variable susceptibility within and among species, and it really depends on geography, where you are in the state. Um, we have evidence of, of significant uh, exposure to to plague and wood rats in certain locations like a uh, site in Ventura County. Um, there's a really neat cycle of plague in Lava Beds National Monument um, where the, the wood rats are actually using lava tubes and uh, they have these big wood rat nests in there that have been there for hundreds of years probably and uh, the, every once in a while plague gets down into there and we'll, we'll get some reported wood rats um, dead in, in lava tubes that come back positive and um, so it's kind of a, a neat cycle there and also you know places like the Modoc Plateau there have been cases of humans that have that they've attributed to wood rat exposure um, to either their uh, dead rodent or their fleas or something like that um, and what's interesting about wood rats is that they often communally nest or other species use their nests um, so there's that possibility for interaction between the species and their vectors. Um, and again, their their common fleas are are also decent vectors of plague. Uh, the last critter on the right there is the Belding's ground squirrel. Um, now, I generally tend to think of these similar to a California ground squirrel. Only difference is that they're kind of geographically restricted. They're not as widespread. They're high elevation in the Sierras or up on the Modoc Plateau. Um, but they have a similar resistance or susceptibility to California ground squirrels. So wherever we do see them, and if they're in a near a, a recreational area, we do try to capture them to um, get some samples. Um, but they may be locally important in both the enzootic and, and epizootic cycles, just depending on those local conditions. So I'd like to wrap this up by uh, going over our 2020 plague activity, which for the most part, uh, last year was fairly low and, and minimal. Um, we weren't seeing a ton of activity early in the in the summer. Um, just a few spots here and there and in southern Sierra and um, only one carnivore um, was tested positive for plague in, in Butte County. So overall it was it was looking like a pretty pretty um, easy summer um, until uh, August 12th, when we were alerted to a uh, suspect uh, plague isolate from a South Lake Tahoe resident. Um, the resident was a, an adult female. Yeah, she became ill in early, early August, and uh, luckily she recovered 
um, with antibiotic treatment. Um, and she, she didn't really report any travel outside of South Lake Tahoe and, and the recreational areas there. Uh, so we kind of ramped up um, from our slow season and you know got everything in gear. And uh, one of the first things we do in, in response to a, a, a human case is to, to get the word out. Um, and so we we um, we asked the local vector control district, El Dorado um, County Vector Control, um, to place warning signs uh, and the and the U.S. Forest Service uh, to place uh, our plague warning signs uh, basically everywhere. Um, we wanted to get the word out. Um, this is a, a known um, kind of hot spot for plague, so people are used to seeing our, our cautionary signs, but. Uh, we asked them to put these these warning signs, which are a bit brighter and a bit, you know, more bold, eye eye catching, um, to to warn folks. Um, following that, uh, I believe it was the next week, uh, biologists from the vector borne disease section and El Dorado El Dorado County Vector Control um, went out and we did visual assessments of several sites. Um, based on uh, our discussions with the case patient. So we walked through seven sites um, and we swabbed burrows at three of those and swabbing burrows basically entails uh, putting a, a flannel cloth into a rodent burrow to see if any uh, fleas hop onto it. Then we can take those, uh, whatever fleas we do catch and uh, test those and see if any come back positive. Um, as far as for uh, for future rodent surveillance, we chose four locations um, based on our visual assessments. A couple days later, we came back um, to do the actual rodent surveillance at, at those four, um, four locations. So two of the locations were on U.S. Forest Service property. One was um, at a trail system called Hartunian Trails. Um, fairly heavily used by the local residents to, for walking your dogs and hiking, that kind of a thing. Um, and the other spot was at Talak Point, uh, which is a popular picnic area and also trails and uh, run, run throughout. Uh, we also did sampling at two uh, residences that were associated with the case patient. You can see on the map how uh, close all of these areas were to one another. Um, on uh, uh, so so as far as the um, their surveillance results uh, for these four sites, uh, so we're starting with the two uh, Forest Service sites here. Uh, Talak Point, which is that picnic type area, caught 25 rodents. Uh, none were seropositive for white pestis antibodies. Um, however, we did collect quite a few fleas off of the rodents we collect uh, we sampled. Um, and pooled those into 265 fleas total and pooled those into 68 pools, um, five of which were positive for white pestis uh, via PCR. Um, at the other Forest Service location, Hartunian Trails, we captured 27 rodents um, and five of those were serologically positive for antibodies to Yersinia pestis. However, um, none of the 40 uh, flea pools were positive for, for plague. Um, again, 245 total fleas. So um, the, the main story here was the incredibly high flea loads at these locations. Um, we primarily caught chipmunks at both locations, a few ground squirrels, but not nearly as many as we expected. Um, but the, the fairly robust population of chipmunks and an incredibly high flea load on some of these. The, the chipmunk I'm holding there in the top picture is a juvenile yellow pine chipmunk that had 37 uh, fleas on it, which is unheard of um, as far as I know. Um, at the two residences that we uh, sampled, we only caught deer mice and um, we did not do any further testing on those. So uh, let me back up here. We, we had a decision to make um, kind of a logistical decision, but uh, basically we needed to do some some control of some variety. Um, and really what what pushed us over the edge was those high flea loads and the, um, the, the high number of positive flea pools at that Talak point. You know, five of 27 uh, positive rodents at Hartunian Trails is 
is a decent number that were positive, but the fact that there weren't any fleas that were positive um, indicated to us that maybe this was a past exposure, whereas at Talac Point, bacteria in the fleas indicates this is an ongoing in, in, uh, activity. So we chose to do flea control at Talac Point, um, and that initially uh, involved putting out 80 bait stations with uh, carp that were the carpeted bait tubes, um, and the carpet was sprayed down with a delta methrin, a liquid delta methrin, delta methrin product. Um, they were placed at fairly equal intervals around this Kiva Beach Talac Point area, parking lot, and adjacent trails. Um, so we 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 did uh, put out quite a few of those bait stations. The uh, following day um, was uh, the big effort where um, we went out and we uh, applied uh, delta methrin dust directly to um, any burrows that we could see throughout the area. Um, and this is again fairly labor intensive, requires a huge group of people that you can see in that photo. Um, and you basically go through and find whatever rodent burrows you can and you squirt some um, delta dust down in that. And that hopefully that would that would kill any um, fleas that were present. Uh, the following day on September 4th, uh, the Forest Service opened, reopened both locations. Um, actually, uh, reopened to Lac Point, Hartunian Trails was never closed. Um, and then subsequent flea surveillance found no fleas on any hosts at that location. So we went from super high flea loads, highest almost we've ever seen on chipmunks, to not a single flea um, found. So our control efforts were very effective um, in controlling that outbreak there. Uh, on that same day that we did the the, the burrow dusting, we also conducted some additional rodent surveillance um, at nearby sites that we have historically had uh, plague activity. Um, that would be the Kiva picnic area directly adjacent to, to Lac Point, um, the Taylor Creek Visitor Center, which is pretty much adjacent as well, and then Fallen Leaf Campground, which is um, across Highway 89, which is a, a rather large campground um, that we've had to treat in the past for plague activity. And here's just some quick results from that surveillance. Um, and basically the bottom line here is plague was active in South Lake Tahoe pretty much wherever you looked. Um, we captured 36 rodents at all of these locations. 10 of them came back positive uh, for antibodies um, and they were uh, positive rodents found at each location. So, um, but none of the 56 flea pools uh, were positive for for white pestis bacteria, which was good. Um, so we we chose not to do any additional flea control um, at most of the locations. However, at the Kiva picnic area, which is at top row, you see that four of six rodents were positive for um, antibodies. So. That was kind of concerning. It's a, concerning it's a small sample size, but we thought, well, we have these bait tubes out here already. So we just decided to move those that were right next to the to that location over to um, the Kiva picnic area. Um, however, we then came back a week or two later um, and trapped additional animals and found that there really was no effect um, on the flea loads on the rodents in that area just from the bait tubes alone. So uh, one thing we did find, which is probably the primary reason the, that we weren't super successful um, in controlling the fleas, was that uh, basically the bait that we were using was taken almost an hour after it was rebated. So uh, I'll show you a couple clips here. And um, the one on the left, you'll notice it says September 23rd, 2020 at 9.30. You can see 2G from El Dorado County just uh, applied the bait. And then on the right here, you'll see September 23rd, 2020, an hour later, there's a uh, California ground squirrel. You'll see him go into the trap. He grabs the bait and he runs off with it. So um, that baiting method is not ideal uh, because they can just take it and, and the attractant is then gone. And then in subsequent um, review of, of all of the video that we have, uh, kind of the back of the, the envelope 
calculation I made was basically of the rodents that, that triggered the camera, um, over 90% didn't even enter the tube after the, the bait was taken. So most often they would come up, sniff around, and then run away. So they weren't getting um, treated at all. So um, that's concerning. Um, you know, primarily what we're using these bait tubes for is for chipmunks and smaller rodents. You know, we can see California ground squirrel burrows. They're big, they're obvious, and they're easy to treat. Chipmunks, um, there's just a tiny little hole in the ground or in a log somewhere. So they're much difficult, more difficult to treat with the dust. Um, so the, the, the bait tubes are there to kind of complement the, the burrow dust thing. Um, and what we found with our videos, and I'll play this little guy here. Um, you can see this mouse inside the bait tube. Um, obviously interested, there's no bait to be had, but you can see it's pretty much just getting its feet and maybe its tail um, is actually touching the treated carpet. So, um, you know, basically the, the hole diameter, the pipe diameter is too large. We could use a, lo a longer pile carpet like a shag, but I don't, it's difficult to find that. Um, we can use a constriction to maybe uh, prevent California ground squirrels from entering the tube at all and taking the bait, or we can just use a smaller diameter um, tube to just target some of those smaller animals. Um, we did notice there was some interesting carpet fibers from a lot of the animals. They would they would chew them up and take them with them. Um, so that might be another um, option for maybe even treating their nest is leaving a pile of stuff that they would consider good for nesting material, but that has been treated. You never know. But anyways, we, we plan on um, evaluating, putting more game cameras out and kind of evaluating some new um, new ways of using these bait tubes um, this coming season. And uh, just wrap up here. Uh, so for some of the future directions of our program, we've had a, a long-term plague review um, outlining many of the things I, I just went over, in addition to some of the evaluating some of the, the, the uh, programmatic biases that we have in our sample collection methods. Um, and so we, we look, we're looking to, uh, to get that published so that folks can, can review it. Um, maintain adequate surveillance. We, you know, COVID hit hard. So last year was difficult to get um, out to a lot of places because of shutdowns and things like that. So we want to really um, maintain our, our surveillance at, at areas that we know that are higher risk for, for the public. Um, and Sentinel sites, this idea, um, basically we're, we're looking into the idea of creating sites that we have standardized collection methods and timing of sampling so that we can compare across the state um, what's going on at some of these hotspots to, to get kind of a long-term uh, data set going. Uh, flea ecology and plague. So, you know, I, I covered the rodents and the carnivores, um, but the, the other half of the equation are the fleas. Uh, we have a lot of data on fleas. We would like to actually start analyzing that and collecting better data. Um, so that's going to be something in the future um, that we're going to be working on is trying to, to get some more information on the ecology of fleas and on these rodents um, in the near future. And then, uh, like what I just went over, um, control is is the ultimate goal when we do have a epizootic. So we do want to evaluate our control measures to make sure that they're effective and um, see if anything needs to be changed. So uh, with that, I am done. Um, now would be the time for questions if this weren't a webinar. So if you do have any, um, there's my contact information. Um, it's best to send me an email if you need um, at this point.